We talked last week about the capture of the so-called Golden State Killer, a man accused of at least 12 murders, 45 rapes, and dozens of burglaries in California from 1974 to 86. At the time, police weren't saying what led them to believe 72-year-old Joseph D'Angelo might be their man. But now we know. We ended up generating a DNA profile from the Golden State Killer evidence. And then we're able to take that profile and upload it into a open source public genealogy database called GEDmatch. GEDmatch then is able to search that profile against the other public profiles that individuals have placed in there. Once we got the initial uh, DNA match results and found very distant relatives, it took us four months. Okay, so in short, police managed to match some DNA left behind at a crime scene to a relative of D'Angelo's who used one of those commercial genetic testing companies like 23andMe or Ancestry.com to trace their lineage and then apparently use the database that anyone can access. Obviously a big win for investigators, an innovative, high-tech, new form of sleuthing, but are there privacy concerns here as well? Should police be able to search my genetic profile at the click of a button, no warrant required? Joining me are Johnny Kung. He's director of new initiatives at the Personal Genetic Education Project at Harvard. Good to meet you, Johnny. Thanks Thanks for being here. Kate Grockford, director of the Technology for Liberty program at the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. Kate, good to see you as always. Did I do an adequate job of explaining that, or did I get something wrong in there? Yeah, I think so. Um, I got something wrong or I did a good job? No, you did Uh, a good job. (laughs) It's sort of like Cambridge Analytics to me, the sequel. Is, Is it... Is that a fair comparison? Well, sort of. I mean, in the same way that technology has vastly outpaced the law in this area. And unfortunately, um, the Supreme Court has ruled in a way that is not so great. Uh, There's a case called Marilyn v. King from a few years back in which the court, um, against a dissent, a scathing dissent written by Justice Scalia and co-signed by um, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan and Justice Ginsburg. Yeah, Scalia. Yeah, Scalia wrote the dissent and the case held, the majority held, that not only can police solicit, swab your cheek for your DNA and upload it into a federal or state database and keep it forever. But they can do that even subsequent to an arrest, not just a conviction. And so what if you're never convicted? Can they, it's they there can and it's gone it. forever? That's right. Can I stay on the mechanics just for a second? My understanding is this stuff on this public database mm-hmm. is un- unidentified data. Am I right about that? So, uh, so the data on the, uh, on the public database, they are matched to the, to the, to the whoever is submitted the sample, but... Um, Can an you, outsider, though, who accesses... You, so so, so what, how, how it works, um, as far as I understand it, is, is um, you can create a profile to, to search, um, to find matches to your uh, DNA data, but you can never actually see the DNA data that it matches to, um, but you can find a person whose profile matches uh, to their... To their but if, if, assuming that they originally used to start this whole thing, mm-hmm. the relatives of D'Angelo used, let's say, 23andMe for mm-hmm. argument's sake, that's a private database from what I understand. And had those people not uploaded their data onto this GEDmatch thing, then they would never have found him and there wouldn't be a violation of privacy issues. Is that not right? Well, it's unclear. I mean, you know, companies like 23andMe are saying, we will never give your information away to anyone. But the law on this is not Sort of like clear. Facebook, so, actually, right? Yeah, exactly. Agree. So, 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 actually, we, we, so actually, uh, sort of companies like 23andMe, um, uh, how they talk to describe it is that they would comply with um, with uh, a war- a warrants, subpoena subpoenas. Some. So, so they, they orders, would try yeah. to, yeah, they will try to uh, resist it to the legal extent possible, but they would, uh, if they... Uh, cannot resist it, then they will so do 23 it. So 23andMe becomes so 23 and you and 23 and, and police else. and <laughs> a- everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you seem to agree you are not, and this is not illegal. Is it, violation, mm-hmm. is it violative of any company site policy? Or once you put your data on this public mm-hmm. access thing, so uh, essentially it's there for anybody to see? So as far as uh, uh, we know right now uh, for JetMesh, um, it doesn't violate their... Um, Current uh, uh, user terms, um, it is available for for public to view, and I think the police, um, because they were in custody of the of the of the DNA sample, they weren't illegal in creating a profile to to um, try to match to find find identity. But for companies like Two and Three and me uh, and and any private companies like I was. Describing earlier, yeah. you, the police will need uh, a, a warrant, warrant a subpoena. To, to do. You know, so well, you know me well enough to know that I care about privacy stuff a lot, but I also care about serial rapists and murderers. 
being caught, this guy would still be free. Now, allegedly, he's not committing crimes anymore, but my understanding is in 11 other states, similar stuff has been used to capture the bad guys, so to speak, for lack of a better expression. So where is the balance here? People chose to put their data on a public access site yeah, and they no sure did. laws were broken mm -hmm. so and maybe people will think twice about doing that sort of thing from here on out but I mean, but until they do think twice are you troubled by the fact that the cops did what that which was perfectly legal and were able to get somebody who is about as heinous a criminal as walks the planet well, there are a couple of things Allegedly. here. I mean, we, we should talk more broadly about the larger issues raised by law enforcement using DNA in criminal investigations. So there are a few things. One is that in any case in which, you know, I leave this studio and a law enforcement official comes in here and takes this mug back to the DNA lab at the state police they've in Massachusetts, DNA, right. they've got my DNA. And that's a real issue because we leave traces of ourselves behind us everywhere we go, on subways, on public streets, and cups we throw in the trash, and cigarette butts we throw on the, gra on the ground. And so for And the law way to stop that is for legislatures, either state right. or federal, so, to do something. Exactly. So the legislature in Massachusetts and in other states should pass statutes that require law enforcement to merely get a warrant to conduct that type of genetic testing on material that someone uh -huh. leaves behind. Law enforcement makes the argument now that, what, you threw the cup away, you have no right to privacy in it. Well, things are changing substantially. The amount of information, and I'm sure you can talk more mm. to this than I can, that you can derive from a piece of someone's DNA goes well beyond whether you were in a place at a given time. Deep into health information. I want to, that's mm -hmm. exactly where yeah. I want to go. Most people watching the show are not going to worry about becoming mass murderers or serial rapists, but they are worried about their health insurer. Mm -hmm. They are worried about their employer. Mm -hmm. As the law currently exists now, starting with you and then going, mm -hmm. should I be worried about that if I go on 23andMe and upload some data on mm -hmm. a, a public database that my yeah. employer can find out, my health insurer can find out, yes. and potentially act based upon it? Yeah, so currently um, in the United States there is the uh, legislation called GINA, uh, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which, which does uh, prohibits um, health insurance and employers from using, uh, from compelling you to take Tests, so that is one use, place where yeah, law has where, caught up. Yes, with where it has, there was, in fact, um, when it was passed, it was uh, bipartisan support, I think almost unanimous. Uh, so what should I worry about? So, if I shouldn't currently worry about yeah. health data or my employer, mm -hmm. quickly, so, what, what so, should I worry so about? So I think uh, the important uh, point here is for, for uh, the public to become informed about what uh, their genetic information can be used for. Uh, what kind where, of legal where the health for? information, uh, when, it, when they try to do a, a, a test, genetic testing for health or for ancestry, to have to understand um, the implication for law enforcement or for other things, um, be informed so that they can uh, understand the, the acceptance of the risk level, uh, whether they're, they're willing to do but this. I, I want to stay away from law enforcement yeah. for the last 30 sure. seconds. Yeah. In normal life, for most of us who mm -hmm. don't violate the law, at least knowingly, Tell me quickly what I should be worried about, this data being used for. Well, I'm not going to answer that question because I think we do actually need to be concerned about the ways in which law enforcement can access this information. So there's a case well, in California. Well, fine. So that's there. But, but I, I want to know. There's a really interesting case in California quickly. that I think it's important for people to know about. A man was convicted of a crime based largely on DNA evidence that was derived through this sort of experimental DNA testing. And the ACLU is involved in, in his challenge because he basically said to the court, I want to be able to access the algorithm that coded this DNA, so, or that sequenced it, so I can have my own experts challenge it. And the court said, no, this is a pr proprietary corporate test, and you have no right to access that data. So there are a number of different ways in which the legal system and, and uh, you know, legislatures certainly have failed to update the law to reflect these new technologies. And, and so this appeal is ongoing at the California Supreme Court. Um, but it's a really serious issue because these you know, forensic information is not always what it's cracked up to be, right? I mean, we have the two major drug lab scandals here in Massachusetts that have shown us that forensic evidence may not be actual evidence. Um, and that is certainly the case with bite marks um, that have been widely discredited and hair follicle examinations that the FBI relied on for many years that, you know, is basically junk science. So we got to go. Next time we'll talk about people who don't commit crimes. <laughs> John, it's good to see you. Thank you. Kate, thank Thanks, you very Jim. much. Good to see thank you. you.